So Jude chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. So others show mercy with fear, hating, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Let us pray and let's ask God for guidance and wisdom as we study His words. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, as we read your word today, may you give us uh, understanding and wisdom and give us um, the joy to receive it, Lord, um, to receive and have the desire to obey your words, O oh Lord Jesus. God, thank you for your revelation. Thank you for giving us the grace of actually revealing to us your will. God, help us to um, obey your will, O oh God, and, and be faithful people of you, Lord. Uh, we give you all the glory and the honor and thanksgiving. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jude um, wrote this letter, the, the, the letter of Jude. Uh, to the church to appeal to the church to contend for the faith. Although Jude's initial desire was to write about believers' common salvation, but because of the urgency, he was compelled uh, by the Holy Spirit to, to write these warnings regarding uh, the apostates or, or the false teachers. Now, what's with the urgency? Why, why, why did he suddenly change his uh, topic? Instead of writing about common salvation, he instead write about uh, false teachers. What's, what's with the rush? Uh, because these uh, apostate false teachers had now crept into the church. They're no longer just outside the door knocking. They are already inside the gathering of the believers, causing destructions and, and deceiving people. But what intensified the necessity of this letter to be written was the nature of how this false teacher, uh, teachers crept in the church. Jude said they crept in unnoticed, meaning they were able to infiltrate the church in a very subtle way. They were not noticed by the people. How did they, how, how did they come in unnoticed? As Jesus said in his warning, false teachers are wolves wearing sheep's clothing. They would act like a Christian, speak like a Christian. They would use biblical language and, and Christian languages. They would use some Bible verses and, and twist it a little bit so that they would appear to be genuine uh, believers. But all these with an intent to deceive God's people. All these to lead believers astray and to disobedience. So how did they come in unnoticed? Well, they basically pretended to be like one of the believers. They, would to be, they, they pretended to be like Christians. Now, as we in the church today are in a similar situation, a situation many wolves are able to creep in, uh, into the church because they are wearing sheep's clothing. They would call themselves pastors or ministers. Uh, some would call themselves bishops. They would use biblical Christian language to hide their deceptions. Yet their objective is for selfish gains, uh, to gain power, to gain wealth by deceiving God's people. Therefore, Jude, throughout this letter, labored on helping the church to identify these false teachers and to warn them of their destruction. He used Old Testament communities to show the reality that, God, uh, that ungodly people can indeed be present within the gatherings of the believers and use them as references of the true characteristics of these apostate false teachers. He also used individual characters to indicate that these false teachers have abandoned themselves or are, are, are following ungodly principles. Um, that they follow the way of pride, that the, the way of works, and totally abandon themselves in the, the greed of their selfishness that leads them to their destruction. Jude also used nature analogies to make vivid images of how dead and fruitless these apostates are and how they totally go against God's original design or, or God's beautiful and perfect will. So this has been what Jude is doing in this letter, to equip the church of discernment against false teachers and their false teachings. But now what? Now that the church is equipped, 
Now that the church know about the presence of, of, of the false teachers in the church, not that, now that we can identify them, now what? What now shall we do as believers of Jesus Christ? We have looked at verses 14 to 21 as, as part of our last sermon we had from Jude. And we had a quick run through to some of the practical instructions of Jude to the church. And today as we look at verses 21 to 23, we will continue to receive instructions of how should we Christians respond to the knowledge and the warnings that we have received regarding the presence of the false teachers within the gathering of believers. So let us now jump into the passage. In verse 21, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, what does it mean? We have already looked at how we can keep ourselves in the love of God in our previous studies of verses 20, uh, 17 to 21. Uh, Jude instructed us to remember the warnings of the teachings of the apostles. That's in verse, uh, verse 17. So basically to equip ourselves with, with discernment, to be always alert whenever we hear a teacher uh, or from a pulpit or from, even from YouTube. So basically that's one, one, uh, one instruction of how we can keep ourselves in the love of God. Remember the warnings of the apostles. The second instruction how we can keep ourselves in the love of God is to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. That's in verse 20. Jude's, Jude's appeal in the beginning of this letter is to contend for the faith, to fight for the faith. Now, this is not merely speaking of faith in, in our salvation, but as the totality of our belief, which means uh, the principle and, and the, the, the doctrine of Christian faith. So contend for the faith uh, is, yeah, basically fighting for the Christian principle. But do, how do we contend for the faith if we don't know what the faith is? Like, so we must grow so, so Jude is instructing us to build ourselves in the most holy faith, to grow from it, uh, grow in it, learn it, and, and practice it. Now, how do we apply this instruction today? We'll basically grow by reading the Word of God, by studying the Word of God, uh, by memorizing the Word of God, and, and by applying the Word of God. So that's us building ourselves in the most holy faith. The third instruction in, of how we can keep ourselves in the love of God is by praying in the Holy Spirit. Have a prayerful life. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Seek for guidance and wisdom and seek the will of God by praying in the Holy Spirit. And the fourth one is to be helpful in the future fulfillment of our salvation in Jesus Christ. That as we do all these things, our hope is Christ coming to rescue us from the presence of sin. But I think when we read this passage in verse 21... Um, instructing us to keep ourselves in the love of God, I think we can't avoid to ask the question, why? Why should we keep ourselves in the love of God? Isn't it promised in the book of Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God? Did not Jesus say that no one can snatch us away from the Father's hand? Well, even Jude, in this letter, the very same letter, verse 24, that Jesus is the one that can keep us away from stumbling. So why would you ask the church to keep ourselves in the love of God? Now here will come the doctrine of the human responsibility. That even though the Bible is very clear that God is sovereign over all creation, including us humans, even though the Bible teaches that, the, that God wills everything to happen, at the same time, the Bible also teaches that God also decrees the means in fulfilling His will. One example is our salvation. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and He is the one that saves. Yet He uses preaching, the preaching of the gospel, as the means for people to be saved. He uses faith in Jesus Christ and repentance as the means for people to be reconciled with Him. So even though we believe that God is sovereign over all and in our salvation, we also believe that in His sovereignty, He decreases he decrease human responsibility, which is to believe and to repent. God has given us commandments and instructions that are responsibility to obey. In the same way, keeping ourselves in the love of God, God is indeed sovereign, and He will not allow any of His elect to fall away from his love. But at the same time, we have the responsibilities to keep ourselves in his love as well. 
which are the pro four practical instructions given in, in the previous verses. To discern falsehood from truth, uh, to keep growing in our faith, and to be in constant prayer, uh, to be in, com uh, in, in constant com uh, communion with God, and to fully hope in Christ alone. Now, I understand that it's, it's, it's difficult to totally reconcile these two truths of God's sovereignty and, and human responsibility in our minds, but we should not, you know, it's, it's hard to totally reconcile them, but we should not totally separate these two as well, which most of us, uh, most of the time, are, are guilty of. We mostly fail to, uh, we mostly uh, fall to the logical fallacy of, of either or, that we must choose one from the other. But this should not be the case for these two doctrines. These two truths exist. God is sovereign, and he, he fulfills his will at the same time. But at the same time, we humans are responsible whether we will obey God or not. So keep yourselves in the love of God. It's our responsibility. It is a command that we must obey. And I, and I tell you, it is daunting. Because what if I fail, right? What if I get tempted? What if my flesh overcame me and, and become lazy? And I become lazy. This is where the sovereignty comes in. Because honestly, if you are left alone to keep yourselves in the love of God by your own strength and capabilities, you will fail. You will get tempted. You will be overcome by your flesh. But our hope is not ourselves, but the sovereignty of God. That despite of the, uh, despite of the temptation, despite of the challenges, despite of what the enemies throw at you, you will keep yourself in the love of God. Why? Because you are being kept by God in His love in the first place. You will keep yourself in the love of God because God Himself is keeping you in it. Now, just to hopefully make sense of of it a little more. Let us put it this way. If you are truly in the love of God, you will have the desire to discern false from truth. If you are truly in the love of God, you will have the desire to grow in faith. And you will have the desire to commune with God. If you are truly in the love of God, you will be hopeful of Christ's return. In short, if you are truly in the love of God, you will have the desire to keep yourself in the love of God. And that's God's sovereign will to save you being fulfilled. And that's one way we can see uh, that uh, God is sovereignly, sovereignly working in you through your desire of Him. Now, this is a great opportunity to ask the question then. Do you have the desire to discern truth from error? Do you have the desire to grow in faith? Do you have the desire to commune with God? Because if you have not, you may have to assess yourself. If you're truly in the love of God, because if you have no desire to keep and remain in the love of God, then you have never experienced the love of God. You have not yet fully experienced His salvific grace and forgiveness. So assess yourself and be honest. Have you truly surrendered yourself in the Lordship of Christ? Have you really repented of your sins and have totally abandoned all self-righteousness and have fully your, uh, placed your faith in Christ for salvation. God has commanded us to be holy, yet we have not fulfilled that. We failed in many ways to fulfill our responsibilities. Instead of obeying, we decided and, and decided to rebel and do what we think was right before our eyes. We all have fallen short of the glory of God and, and therefore deserving of punishment in hell. Yet instead of justly sending us straight to hell, God decided in his will to save people. People who did not seek him. People who suppressed his truth. He decided to give them a new heart and save them by sending his only son. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled all righteousness, all the responsibilities that we can never fulfill. He lived a righteous life, yet at the same time, while living here on earth, he died by giving his life as the substitute for those who would believe in him. So instead of us receiving our punishment, Jesus took those punishments to himself. To those who would believe in him will no longer have, have to experience hell. 
they would, not, they would now stand righteous before God, not because of their own efforts or deeds, but because they had believed in the finished work of Christ. So God is, in His Word, is commanding all people to repent of our sins and put our faith in Christ alone because it is the only way that we, we can be saved from our deserving punishment in hell. So if you have not yet submitted yourself to God or have not yet truly experienced His love and His forgiveness, now is, that, not now is the time. Now is the opportunity. Tomorrow is never promised. The power is, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is not your kindness. It is not your niceness. It's not your attendance in church services. But only through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that you can be saved. Therefore, I call you today to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ alone and be saved. So now going back to the passage Jude understood the situation of the church in his time. The, the, the early church was in a tight spot, cornered by the enemies. While getting persecuted and, and engaging in a war against the outside culture, forces of their day, uh, the church has, has also to defend themselves from the deception and the destructions uh, um, of the false teachers within the walls of the, the church itself. Therefore, he instructed them of their best defensive strategy, which is to keep themselves in the love of God, to hope in Christ, to know the truth and be in constant communion with God. For their greatest security is not by their kindness and just to accept false teaching and, and, and uh, uh, false teachings of the apostates. It is not by adopting their culture, hoping that it would stop them for, from persecuting the church. No, their greatest security is to be grounded in the truth and in the love of God. For greater is the destruction of being outside of God or being outside of the love of God and be in hell. Now, similarly for us, we can clearly re relate to the situation of the early church. The church currently are engaged in, a, uh, in, a, in the culture war against the secular world. And at the same time, false teachers are spreading destructive heresies within the church. We are in the same situation. And our defensive strategy is the same. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Discern truth from evil. Keep growing in your most holy faith by studying the words. Place, uh, keep a prayerful life. And, full, uh, and place all your hope in Christ alone for your salvation. So keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now, that's our defensive strategy. That's how we can protect ourselves from the attack of the enemies. But being only in defense will not actually win us the war. So therefore, our responsibility is not only to defend ourselves from the attack, but also to attack and to fight back. Isn't that the command of our Lord to go and make disciples of all nations? Romans, Romans 1 said that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. So ultimately, it is the preaching of the gospel that saves people. So today, as we look at the next passages, that, uh, the instruction of Jude, always remember that the gospel is the end goal of every approach. So now in verse 22 to 23, uh, Jude laid out to us the offensive strategy of the believers and how we should fight back. In these verses, Jude spoke of three, uh, Jude spoke of different groups of people. Now there is a dispute whether Jude is speaking of two or three groups. Uh, actually, all commentaries are unsure for even in the Greek Bible, it is not clear if, if he's speaking two or three groups. But in my understanding of the passage, he must be speaking of three groups. Uh, now, the reason for this is because it is more consistent in, in Jude's literature style. Uh, throughout the letter, he's been using uh, triads or triplets, uh, basically giving three Old Testament communities, three ungodly characteristics, and three Old Testament characters. But of course, with the exception of the five nature that he has given. But generally, 
uh, triads has been his pattern. So most likely in this passage as well, he's using triads or um, triplets. But, but regardless, if he um, is speaking of, of true or three groups, the main intention or, or motive of Jude here is to say that we have to discern how we should deal with different people. Although the message or, or, uh, the, uh, although the, message or the gospel um, that we will be preaching is the same, we must as well understand that not everybody are the same, uh, that we must deal with people differently with discernment. So the first group of people mentioned here by Jude are the doubters. He instructed us to have mercy on those who doubt, verse 22. So basically, these are the people who are the hesitant, the Christian that was swayed by false teachers. Those are, uh, the, who are wavering in their commitment to the faith that was once in all delivered to the saints. Now, um, just to give an example, I was born in the Philippines. Uh, in the Philippines, there's not much to, to preaching happening at all, uh, at least when I was there. The Bible was not placed to the highest authority, uh, although used as references and, and quoted, and quoted uh, a lot. It was still the preacher's opinion that matters. Most Christian churches were influenced by the prosperity gospel preachers. So therefore, prosperity gospel was what, you'd, uh, uh, what you hear and what you absorb. So I could say I was swayed by the false teachers. Only when I came here in Australia that I was able to have a, a fast enough internet <laughs> that I was able to hear faithful preachings from R.C. Sproul and, and John MacArthur and other Reformed people. And by God's sovereign grace, he sent Pastor Warren to, to preach to, uh, the truth to us. Truth about the authority of the word of God and the truth about the gospel. Because of God, through his instruments that he used, who have showed us or showed me mercy, who showed me patience, understanding, compassion, that I came to the truth. Of course, it is a journey of growing in faith, and it is life, lifelong, but uh, it does require help. It does require mercy from the faithful ones. And likely, most of us have been somehow uh, swayed by the false teachers. But because of the people that God has used, who showed you mercy, who showed you patience, compassion, uh, perseverance, you have now come to the truth of the gospel. So, yeah, so show mercy and win some doubters. Mercy is your offensive weapon. So that's, that's Jude's instruction. Have mercy on those who doubt and who are hesitant. Show patience and compassion. We ourselves are ultimately recipients of, of the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, show mercy and compassion and win these people over. Now, the second group is in verse 23. It says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. Now, the metaphor here seems to indicate urgency. It's like seeing a child who is running towards a bonfire. You have to snatch him away with, with firmness. He is nearly there. He is nearly there. He's on his way to danger. So basically, this is referring to people who have been deceived and have now committed to the errors of the false teachers. They are now living in the errors. Sorry. They're now living in the errors of the false teachers. Now, fire here is referring to hell, the suffering in eternal damnation. So these people are basically so committed to the errors that they are now on the edge of eternal damnation. A biblical example of this was Lot in the book of Genesis. If you remember the story, Lot was the nephew of Abraham. Lot was living in the city of Sodom, a city indulged in sin. The city was judged by God and about to get burned down, but God sent his angel to, angels to rescue Lot, uh, Lot who was living in the, in the city of Sodom. So he was snatched away from the fire by the angels. He was pulled out of Sodom and was saved from the destruction. So basically, this time, the approach is no longer gentle and compassionate, but the approach is confrontational 
basically telling them straight to their face that they are in the danger for the time is running out. They are now in the edge of their destruction. So basically, yeah, so the, 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 the approach here is confrontational. They must be rebuked and they must repent and believe in the gospel. So the first group, the doubters, show mercy, compassion, patience. To the second group, the burning, confront and rebuke, snatch them away from the fire. Now the third group is still in verse 23. It says, to others, show mercy with fear, even hating the garment stained by sin, or stained by flesh. Now, the, in the intensity of Jude's language here seems to indicate that this is now referring to the false teachers themselves. That we believers must show mercy with fear. Now, what is fear referring here? It's referring to the fear of the Lord. The acknowledgement that He is your God and, and revere Him as your Lord. It's the understanding that He is holy and hates sin. So Jude is instructing us that while dealing with these people, equip yourselves with the fear of the Lord. Now, there's two reasons why. First, because these people are dangerous and will tempt you into error. We are never susceptible to temptation. So in dealing with these people, always fear the Lord. That's why in the continuation of verse 23, Jude warned the believers to hate even the garment stained by flesh. This is referencing to uh, the Old Testament that the Jews should not be defiled. That if a clean person should touch unclean clothes, then he will be defiled. So what Jude is saying, as you deal with these people, hate their sermons, hate their teachings. Be watchful and don't, be influence you, or don't, they, don't let them influence you in any way. Equip yourselves with fear. Don't let them deceive you. So that's the first one. It's, it's uh, where, uh, show mercy with fear uh, as, as, as your protection, as you engage against the false teachers. So to know that you are still, uh, you are um, subjected, to, subjected to your Lord, not to their teachings. The second reason why you should equip yourselves with the fear of the Lord while dealing with false teachers is because that's the only way you can show mercy to them. As you reflect and be owed by the holiness of God and His justness and perfection, what you would feel for, for the apostate false teachers are sorrow and pity. For we know that God hates sin and His holiness requires Him to punish sinners. Just how great of a destruction that awaits these false teachers for all their deceptions. So therefore, as we deal with these people, we are to show mercy, but with fear. Because that's the only way we can rescue them to, to, to see the destruction that awaits them. Now, ultimately, God is the one that saves. But this just brings back the reality that God used means to fulfill His will. He chose to use us he saved people to save others as well. That's our human responsibility. Just our re responsibility to, to keep ourselves in the love of God. It is also our responsibility to go and make disciples of all nations. We must win souls as the people of God. Now, before I end, what have we learned from this passage? Now that we are equipped and are warned about the, about the presence of the false teachers in the church, let us then keep ourselves in the love of God. Remember the apostles' warning. Be discerning of, of errors from, from the pulpit or from YouTube. Also, build yourselves up in, in the most holy faith. Study the Word. During the week, spend time studying the Bible. Listen to sermons and read theological books. Also spend time in prayer and be, lead by, be led by the Holy Spirit. And take every opportunity to pray as it is commanded that pray unceasingly. As we wait, and all these things we do, as we wait with hope in the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our defensive strategy dealing with um, the, the false teachers or the enemies of the church. But we can't just be in defense. We must also fight back 
Because the goal is to win souls. So to make disciples of all nations, uh, uh, Jude, as, as in, as, uh, Jude instructed us, let us show mercy on those who doubt. Show, show mercy on those who doubt. Show compassion and patience and understanding. Also to, to others, save them by snatching them out of the fire. Confront and rebuke. And to the others, show mercy with fear. And all this with the goal of preaching the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation. Now what is the gospel? Jesus died for our sin. He was buried, but on the third day, he rose again. And those who repent of their sins and put their trust in him will receive eternal life. And that's the message that we want to um, preach to them. Let us close in prayer.